welcome as the world emerges cautiously from the clutches of the pandemic. We have over 700 delegates signed up and hopefully they will join us during this webinar, Meet the Leadership. We have 700 delegates from 70 countries, ranging from Algeria to Zimbabwe. Let me start very briefly. Um, ground rules, thank you and apologies. Ground rules, you will all be put on mute videos and microphones during the webinar. That will be lifted during the networking session at the end. We're hoping to move into the networking session somewhere between 12.30 and one o'clock. You will be virtually ushered, a new concept, one of the very many we've had to learn into the networking session. Please do stay. We're looking forward to continuing the conversation. The um, only other ground rule that's important is that um, this is recorded. If that's a problem, now's the time to leave. Thank you. Thank you hugely for the questions. We asked for questions to be pre-submitted and we have been inundated. All of them have been read, they've been collated, they've been considered. Some of them we will be able to address in the Q&A session that we get to in this webinar, but not all. Hopefully you can pick them up in the networking and thereafter and bear with us. Because you've been so thoroughly engaged and so appropriately engaged, we are going to be short of time. So I am going now to apologize in advance. As an advocate, I don't do that often. My apologies. There are times, and I have warned my panel, when I will seem rude, uh, aggressive, or perhaps I should say more than usually rude, I'm going to cut them off because I want to get through the entire programme. Having said that, I can't continue. I hand over now to Jonathan to hand, handle the introductions and the first session. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Marion, and good morning to all of those who have joined us from all around the world. My name is Jonathan Wood, and I'm the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, a position I've held for three years. I'm also head of international arbitration at uh, RPC in London, and a director of the London Chamber of Arbitration and Mediation. I mainly sit as an arbitrator these days. But what path have I trodden to reach uh, this uh, position. It has been something of a circuitous route uh, because I have quite an eclectic background. I started my career over 40 years ago as a criminal defence and civil liberties lawyer in the north of England, in Manchester. In that capacity, I defended successfully a mother charged with murder of her baby on the basis it was a cot death, a case of some notoriety. And I took my first case on behalf of prisoners to the European Court of Human Rights as long ago as 1976 and have continued to act on human rights cases for many years. I then took a change of direction after seven years. Criminal law advocacy is a great training ground for advocacy. But I then joined the international law firm Clyde & Co, where I undertook a diet of international trade, insurance, finance, shipping, uh, a broad commercial background. And the point of that is that the venue of choice for this area of the law was often arbitration, which is where I gained my experience. After 27 years at Clyde Co, I then joined RPC 10 years ago, where I head up the arbitration team. And in particular, besides a commission, a commercial background, I specialize in credit and political risk insurance and art law, which is a rich tapestry to uh, be involved in. But let's move to my role as chair of the Board of Trustees. What have I been up to? Well, for the last year, I have been primarily engaged in recruiting our new Director General as successor to Anthony Abrahams, who was with us for eight years. That was no easy task because our new DG was uh, successfully completing a round the world record breaking tour on a tandem. And it was only when I was able to catch up with her in a motel virtually in Arizona that we were able to engage almost a year ago. And I'm pleased to say that Catherine joined us on 
the 1st of May and is now becoming well bedded in to her role. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our world record beating cyclist and new Director General, Catherine Dixon. Catherine. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the great introduction. And um, I'm Catherine Dixon. I'm the new Director General. It's an absolute honour to, to be part of the organisation. I've, I've been, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, around since the 1st of May. So really running the organisation virtually um, since then. And I'm really looking forward to actually uh, getting into the offices and meeting some of the staff. Um, so running a, an organisation virtually has been a, a, a sort of a real experience, but we've all been living, living that. Um, my background is I'm a, I'm a solicitor and uh, I'm a mediator. Um, I have an MBA and I've been a chief executive officer for a number of organisations for around the last 10 years. Um, I was the chief executive of the Society of uh, England and Wales and uh, I did my um, before that I did my my first role as CEO in the National Health Service um, in um, in the UK where I ran the organization which indemnifies the NHS and that's dealing with uh, something like um, 16,000 pieces of ongoing litigation and uh, I had the real sort of privilege, I think, of introducing mediation into, into the NHS, which I think is, uh, you know, is, is a, a fantastic way of, of helping patients um, resolve uh, concerns and, and disputes. But we spent quite a lot of money. So we had a quite a big budget, a bit bigger than the one I've got today. So we were spending about 1.3 billion um, a year in resolving disputes. I've also run a, a large uh, further and higher education college, so I've got a bit of an education background, which I think is quite, it, well, it's really important for, for this role. Um, I spent most of my legal career in-house. Uh, I was the commercial and legal director of Bupa, which is a large private health um, provider and insurer. I was also general counsel at the NSPCC, which is a children's protection charity. Uh, I spent a bit of time living and working in Canada, and uh, I uh, spent time out of the office uh, as an outward bound instructor, where I was um, uh, instructing on uh, the uh, survivors of, uh, of abuse and, and also working with Inuit children. Uh, I was also director of uh, Vancouver Co Coastal Health when I, was, when I was working in Canada. And before that, I was in private, private practice as a, as a commercial litigator, uh, where I, you know, I did use uh, alternative dispute resolution on a regular basis. I left school pretty early, uh, so when I was 16 and um, uh, realised I actually needed education, so I, I joined the army to, to help support my studies. So, uh, so I am a, 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 an officer in the British Army and I continue to be part of the Army Reserve. And as Jonathan mentioned, when I'm not working, I'm, I'm cycling and, uh, you know, I, I, I have just, uh, just broken the record for being the fastest to uh, circumnavigate the globe on a tandem and really just getting back to, um, to, to the UK before lockdown. And um, the, I should have mentioned, actually, that the, the interview that did take place in Arizona, it, the backdrop was the reenactment for the uh, gunfight of the OK Corral, which I could hear going on in the background. So, so that was quite, quite an experience, but it's a real honour to be here and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to this event so so thank you. Thank you very much Catherine. Um, uh, could I now move to uh, our president uh, Francis Xavier who is with us from Singapore. Francis over to you. Well you know hi guys uh, it's great to be here. Um, I grew up in, I was born in Malaysia and I grew up um, playing marbles in a small town called Seremban. Uh, my family was poor, by the grace of God, I narrowly succeeded in getting a scholarship to Singapore at the age of 18 in 1981. And then I trained, I studied in Singapore and, the, you know, with the support of the Singapore government, I became a lawyer, graduated in 88. And I've been practicing in Singapore ever since for 30 years. I've had the opportunity now to serve the Institute as its president. Um, I've been on a world tour. This is a prime example, all on the net, virtually, without taking a step beyond Singapore. Um, and I've been focused on uh, our thought leadership programs. Uh, we have a few, um, a global conference, which we are planning for 2022, uh, a, a partnership project with the Judicial Insolvency Network on looking at uh, global guidelines on the use of arbitration in restructuring and insolvency. We have a, a set up a committee 
uh, we are trying to study what would be the best ADR platform for blockchain smart uh, contracts. Um, and that's what I've been focusing on. On uh, When I'm not uh, uh, practicing law, I, I actually have a rock band, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, I find a, a useful distraction from the study of the law. Uh, I also run an NGO amongst other things in Malaysia, and we look at uh, central forest conservation, which is 130 million years old. Uh, we look at tiger conservation. We've just fed thousands of families who are destitute during the pandemic, and we still continue to, we, we are opening up um, tuition centers and uh, uh, preschool centers and centers for abandoned uh, moms, single moms. Um, but, uh, you know, it's my great pleasure to be here. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francis. Okay, Marion, over to you as our question host. Thank you, and at least this is the first webinar where I haven't been that woman who stays on mute. Catherine, Catherine, world record done? Yeah. Four months, in, four months into the CIR, I, we all know you're looking at CIR strategy. That's a particularly exciting topic. Can you give us some insight? How is this process playing out and what do you see as the priorities? Well, we've had, so thank you, Marion. We've had some great discussions with the board of trustees, with the branch chairs and, and, and committee members and, and um, many members and, and of course the, the staff. And I think it's really important to get views from across the membership about the, the direction of the organization. And, and what we've seen is that there's three um, strategic aims emerging from those discussions. Um, the first one is around global promotion and it's, it's about globally promoting the constructive resolution of disputes. The second is uh, thought leadership and about being an inclusive global thought leader. And the, and the third area um, is around developing and supporting an inclusive global community of diverse dispute resolvers. So thinking about promotion and what what does what does global promotion mean uh, you know for, for me that that's really around engaging with the business community engaging with government um, to, so that really people are, th are thinking about uh, alternative dispute resolution or effective dispute resolution um, before they, they they think about necessarily going down the litigation routes in, into court so it's it's really the I think engaging the business community is going to be crucial and one of the things that we've done in the UK is we've we've come up with a with a with a scheme to help business with disputes arising from the the pandemic and that that's something that we've done in, in collaboration with another um, ADR organization and I think it's something that we can replicate around the world and one of the things we're talking to the branches about is whether there's something we can do similar in their jurisdictions. I think the, on the thought leadership um, work, the, there's quite a lot of things going on at the moment. People will be aware of the remote procedural guidance that we put out. We're also developing some guidance on sustainable arbitration. So looking at you know how we how we can be more more green. Um, we're looking at our mediation guidelines, which will update uh, next year. We've done work on our adjudication guidelines, which were updated this year as well. And we're also engaging with governments around the world. So we've been speaking to the India government government, for example, which is looking at mandating mediation. And obviously that would be, you know, pr pretty, pretty critical for, for, um, for mediators around the world. Um, we, but in addition, we're doing things like a series of, of policy podcasts, um, which, you know, if you haven't had a look at, please do, because they are, there's some really great speakers. We're intervening um, in, in certain cases, which have a, an impact on, on uh, ADR and ADR issues. So we've got a series of, of uh, legal interventions going on. And I think also, you know, we're really sort of thinking about um, the sort of thought leadership program for, 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 for next year and how we, can, how we can develop that and be at the forefront of issues issues such as um, changes in technology and, and, and innovation. So there's a lot going on. I think on, on the critical
quickly on, on the developing and supporting this a global di diverse community. I mean, these sort of events kind of really, really can help promote that. You know, we come together, we've got so many people from so many different countries involved, it's fantastic. Um, but I think, you know, greater engagement with our, with our branches uh, and with our members. We've been doing some uh, branch chair events. We're, we're coming together using MS Teams and using the sort of virtual community so that we've got a much better network and a better able to communicate with each other certainly at branch level. Um, virtual courses, so we've moved all of our courses on, on, on uh, so that, that you, you can participate uh, virtually. Um, and that, that's really enabling participation uh, around the world. We've just launched our virtual mediation course this week. We're also doing our, our Oxford diploma on, online. We've had some virtual events. So we've had uh, Sherry Blair speaking at our Roebuck lecture. We had 1,800 people sign up for that. Another one on mediation, 1,800 people, this, this event. And uh, we've got uh, the Alexandra lecture coming up, which again, we'll do, do online with Richard Suskin speaking. So, and we're also thinking about the member offer. So what do you get from your membership? Um, you know, making sure it's relevant for everybody. We're developing short courses to help with practice. We're simplifying our, our, our pathways uh, through our memberships. So that giving branches and uh, different jurisdictions more flexibility about how they deliver courses while keeping the same standards. And I think there's a, also for me, a very important for the organization, there's a real focus on equality, diversity and inclusion and enabling everybody to get involved irrespective of, of their background, which is, which is really sort of critical for me. So lots going on. <laughs> A huge amount going on. Um, can I just say now to those listening, please, if you've got questions, we're, we're monitoring the chat box, put the questions in. Can't promise that we'll pick them up, but give us your feedback. Let us know what you'd like to pick up on that. Catherine, there's one thing I'd like to pick up on immediately from that list. You use the word inclusion. You use the word diversity regularly. Do you see CIR taking a leadership role in, adv in advancing inclusion and diversity in ADR. I, I, absolutely, I, I, I think it's 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 critical for, for the organisation, and and we are probably uniquely placed to, to do that as 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 a global organisation. So we're, we're developing a, a sort of strategic approach around equality, diversity, and inclusion. We're looking at and, and the focus is is around three areas. It's it's sort of encouraging the best candidates to come into our our profession, uh, sort of irrespective of their background. So how how can we support people to, to get involved irrespective of their background. We're, we're actively working to promote um, opportunities for you know under, underprivileged and underrepresented groups enabling them to, to progress and thrive and we're also sort of looking at developing a, a culture of EDI across every, everything that we do so we're asking the question around what we do you know is it inclusive are there other things that we can do to sort of underpin EDI values and I think just to give you some examples, some tangible examples of some of the things that we're looking to do. So we're working with the Equal Representation in Arbitration Pledge to develop workshops for young women arbitrators. You know, we're looking at um, developing sort of virtual internment for younger members so that they can get experience, which is absolutely critical as they, as they work towards getting their, their first appointment. We're, we're looking at um, a mentorship uh, program, which will be based on, on EDI criteria. So, you know, for experienced practitioners that, that, you know, if you want to get involved with that, please do get in contact because we're, we're desperately in need mentors to, 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 to help us with that. We're working with Sherry Blair's on, on the strategy on supporting younger state arbitrators and we're also offering our introductory courses, our, our ADR courses, it's, you know, significantly discounted with free student membership so that, you know, younger members and people at the start of their career can, can actively get involved. And we're looking at how we can develop that into, into affiliate membership. So there's lots going on, workshops, establishing interest groups, you know, we've got a younger uh, members group if people want to get involved. And, and also thinking about whether we can do anything around hardship, maybe be scholarships and and so it's it's very it's very high on our agenda edi you stressed um mentors if there if anyone watching wants to be a mentor please get in touch that's one example what are you asking of members what can members do to help the cir move forward 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, get, get involved, um, get involved with, with your branches, get involved sort of with the centre, get in touch. You know, if you've got ideas, things that, you, you know, you want to do, then then please, please let us know. We, you know, we, it's really important that we get member feedback and that we're actually meeting your needs. We really want to put the membership at the heart of, of what we do. Um, you know, if you've got feedback on our training and development, then then please do, you know, please do, do give us that feedback. Um, you know, we rely on, on, on our expert practitioners, you know, as part of, as part of our faculty, and they are absolutely fantastic because, you know, they have that experience, that relevant experience of practice and, um, you know, and, and, and again, getting more people involved in that is fantastic. Um, on the, on some of the, the policy issues, because we want to, you know, we very much want to globalize. If you've got issues that are happening within your jurisdiction, which you think are relevant, that we can assist with and that we can perhaps do some thought leadership on or in, indeed engage with, with governments, whatever they that then then let us know, um, and I think you know as you said, Marion, if if there are people who would like to to act as mentors out there, particularly experienced practitioners, um, let us know. But just it's your community, and there's an opportunity to to be part of it, and we really really welcome that. So so please do get in touch, get involved, and uh, it really sort of establishes globally. Well, thanks, Catherine. I, there's so many themes coming out of that that I'm sure we're going to pick up. Can I move now to Jonathan? Jonathan, who, as I discovered today, had con his career has ranged from criminal law in the magistrate's court to international commercial arbitrator. You have seen quite a span, Jonathan. What's been your experience as an ADR practitioner during the pandemic? Well, thanks, Marianne. And I think... Um... The interesting thing is the way that we have been propelled with force into the virtual world uh, and how the virtual world has been embraced by uh, ADR practitioners. I think probably more so in the realms of arbitration uh, than perhaps uh, mediation. But I think that um, the interesting thing for me is that this is not new. Um, the virtual world has been around for a long time. Uh, I can remember doing uh, video conferences with witnesses 20 years ago. I did a trial in the USA with 50 witnesses whose witness evidence was videoed and presented to the tribunal. So it isn't new, but I think the real thing is that we've had to embrace it. And almost the turning point for me was in April uh, with the Viz Moot. And many of you who are watching may have been involved in the Viz MOOC. We normally congregate either in Hong Kong or in Vienna. Uh, but it went, um, it went virtual. Uh, we all of a sudden had to discover how to use these platforms, aided by WhatsApp and Skype and this sort of thing. But it was a real opportunity. It was like a dummy run to run arbitrations on a virtual basis. And I think that was the turning point for many of us in, in, in the arbitral community. We've been involved in a lot of projects. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was very proud that the CIR uh, sponsored, we were the first to provide seed called funding to, was providing a website, uh, virtualarbitration.info, a group of uh, interested arbitrators led by Ben Knowles at Clyde & Co and a whole host of others, in a matter of two weeks, I think, put together a website, which is a repository for information relating to running hearings on a virtual basis. And uh, I, I think that's been really helpful. Uh, and I've seen other, uh, the Society of, uh, of, of Technical Lawyers uh, in England were working on a protocol. It was taking its time, uh, has some things do with the legal community, but all of a sudden faced with, pan with the pandemic, it, it got up and running. So as I say, we've been propelled with force into this era, era and we've embraced it. And I think it has been overall a relatively positive experience. Let's talk about the arbitral institutions and the courts. In your view, what's been their response to the pandemic? Well, I think that it depends whereabouts in the world uh, you are uh, for this. Um, I think that the institutions themselves, the ACC, uh, the uh, uh, HKIC, Singapore, 
uh, LCIA, they have all been fairly quick in assisting their users to operate in the pandemic by uh, supporting uh, arbitrations in a uh, in a virtual environment. The courts have been uh, spotty, I would say, uh, on a worldwide basis. And uh, perhaps I can just make a plug for Richard Suskin's uh, Remote Courts uh, website, which monitors what is going on in the virtual world with courts around the world. A very interesting website. And in fact, we worked with Richard uh, when we were setting up the virtual arbitration uh, 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 website. Um, the English courts, I think, have adapted for business very well. Uh, we have had major trials, the Kazakh versus uh, New York Bank Mellon case, run virtually with witnesses from all different jurisdictions. I think that's been very good. But at the same time, we've had cases like the Johnny Depp defamation case being run live uh, in front of the um, courts in uh, the Strand in London. Uh, and so it, it's been adaptable, I would say. And uh, broadly speaking, I think it's been, you know, the show must go on really, so far as this jurisdiction is concerned and many others besides. It's been a very interesting experience to see how people have reacted. So do you think the show must go on? Do you think that this response that you've described from the institutions and from the courts, the collegiate sharing, the use of virtual hearings, the, the make it make do and mend almost. Do you think that's going to become, now I'm treading very carefully here, so I'm going to use a cliche, which I know will irritate you. Will it become the new normal? I'll duck. Well, <laughs> as you well know, uh, I have a vision of uh, Munch's painting of the screen, scream when I hear the words, <laughs> the new normal. Uh, the fact of the matter is, as I've said previously from my own experience, it is not new. Uh, but I think the point is that we have had to educate ourselves in able to deal with it. So, uh, as I say, uh, people who may not have wished to do so have embraced it. Will it be the, no the new normal? No, I don't think it will be normal. I think it will be uh, used when it's appropriate. And there are drivers for that, as we'll discuss, such as cost. But I think it's part of an evolutionary process. And I think we will take the good things that we've learned out of this process and use those and discard some of them. But I do think that there will still be a feeling uh, that we would like to enjoy each other's company uh, and have the physical meetings, even if we are adversaries in that situation. Well, let's look at, let's not call them challenges. Let's look at the opportunities. Mm. Do you see, well, what do you see as opportunities coming out of the current situation, particularly for the CIR? Well, I think it's this ability to communicate with the membership. And here we are. I think we have 800 people who have registered to see this event. I always think of the experience of the Alexander Lecture that we hold every year. Stavros, uh, he held a, a GAR winning uh, lecture. Uh, it was held uh, at 12 Bloomsbury Square with about 12, uh, with about 70 people in attendance. Uh, it was a great uh, lecture. But then this year we had Sherry Blair doing it online. And as Catherine said, we had 1,800 people who watched that. So this is an absolutely marvellous opportunity to engage with our membership all around the world. And I think that's the real positive that we take from this pandemic. Uh, it means that, you know, it's uh, arbitration sans frontier, if you like. And Jonathan, you won't be aware of this, but while you were speaking, somebody in the chat room just said hello from Lebanon. And we are all aware of yes. the real challenges that is faced then. Exactly. It's, it's, it's an illustration of exactly what you're talking about. Mm. Yes, I once did a case involving Lebanon during the Civil War, and we uh, telex them on a number of occasions, rather um, frostily, why haven't you got back to us? And we eventually got a response saying, we've been hiding in our offices, 
whilst the gunfire has been uh, involved in the last few weeks. So Lebanon is a very difficult story to deal with. But yes, in the current uh, circumstances, our hearts go out to our colleagues out there, particularly Naylor, who was our former uh, president uh, from, from Lebanon. Well, let me take that baton of president and turn to this year's president, the president of the pandemic, Francis. Um, now, I didn't know you started as a marble player. <laughs> a marble player to blockchains. I can try and struggling to find a connection and via a rock band. Some quick questions for you. Um, what difference has membership of the CIR made to you in your career, do you think? Well, you know, when I started practice, it was all litigation. And then, uh, you know, SIEC was born uh, in about 1992. And uh, it was the new kid on the block. And it, I was trained in arbitration by CIR. So I uh, took CIR courses, got trained um, in the knowledge of arbitration. Because when I, when I studied in law school, I didn't learn anything about arbitration. And, and so it was the CIR courses that taught me what arbitration was all about. And the second thing uh, that CIR gave me was the accreditation, right? So I, you know, well, we all know, right? That fellowship is very important. So I, I studied and uh, set that as a mark and with fellowship came recognition, right? So it was, you know, it was a minimum benchmark for you to even approach arbitral institutions. Um, it then gave me the profile. Um, and more importantly, CIR is the, is by and large, uh, you know, encapsulates the bulk of the arbitration community. It is a community. Who appoints you as an arbitrator? The community does. Uh, who appoints you or recommends you as an arbitration counsel? To a large extent, the clients depend upon the community to appoint counsel arbitrators. Uh, and so CIRB is a perfect gateway. The membership in CIRB is a perfect gateway to get to know the community. Now, a lot depends on what you put in. I mean, it, it, you know, the more events you attend, the more people you get to know through CIRB, you know, the bigger your, your community um, and the membership becomes very valuable. I can tell you that everything I am as an arbitrator or an arbitration council today, you know, most of it, I will credit the CIRB. Can we look at the other forms of, of ADR? Can we look, say, pick up on, say, mediation and adjudication? I would welcome your views on the importance of those forms of ADR in the, in the life of a practitioner now. You know, I think many of us have been focused on arbitration because it has been the most sexy. And adjudication, we know in certain segments like construction are very, very important in many, many countries. Uh, but I think many of us, including myself, have long ignored mediation. Um, I have taken, made it a point, I've recently attended a, a training by the SIMC to become an accredited uh, uh, regional panel uh, mediator. And I can see uh, in Singapore, our experience is that mediation is simply growing in leaps and bounds. It is going to be the next big thing. So the one thing I think um, meant all of us would agree on is get accredited, get trained in mediation. Um, the CIR runs a lot of trainings. In fact, we are also thinking of uh, doing joint trainings with the SIMC, but get trained uh, in the mediation pathways, the adjudication pathways. Mediation is gonna be the, definitely the next wave, um, both in its purest form, as well as in its hybrid forms, uh, up, med up, for instance. Uh, mediation, we see a huge wave, especially with the advent of the Singapore Mediation Convention. 53 countries have already uh, signed up to it. Um, so you really need to be, you know, a, a complete ADR specialist, not just an arbitration specialist. One of the themes that has come out in the pre-submitted questions and is still coming out through the chat questions is how. How today does someone entering the world of ADR build a practice? You know, Marion, whatever I will say now, I could be accused of teaching my <laughs> grandmother how to suck eggs. <laughs> but really, you know, I think the path ahead would be obvious to anyone, right? Um, I think it starts first by getting the highest accreditation you can, go for a fellowship, become a chartered arbitrator. It'll take years, mm -hmm. but, you know, always keep that on your horizon and keep working towards it. You know, for, for a long time, it looked, I can, I can, 
confessed, it seemed that it would be difficult for me to reach chartered arbitrator. You know, once I got to fellowship, chartered arbitrator seemed to be out of reach. But, you know, never give up. You know, get trained, uh, do all that is necessary, keep moving in the right direction, and, it, and you will get there. The only thing that will prevent you is your passion and your commitment to that goal, right? So one, once you become a fellow and a chartered arbitrator, you have access to, you know, arbitral panels. Uh, if you approach conference organizers, organizers, they will allow you to speak on their panels because you are seen as an arbitration expert all across the world. We are the global training and accreditation body, right? So our accreditation carries a lot of weight. Now, the, the other thing that we spoke about, get involved, get involved. And this was something Catherine, uh, uh, you know, spoke about. Get involved in your chapter, in your branch. Even if you're an event chair, you're organizing a regional conference, you're organizing a webinar. It's not very difficult now to organize an event, like a webinar. A physical conference, you know, it, it's, it takes a lot of time you know, get involved in the leadership of your branch, become a director, become, uh, you know, uh, part of the leadership, become a branch chair, become a chapter chair, you know, and beyond that, look around, play a leadership role around your region. You know, many regions, um, the surrounding countries will not have chapters or branches. Reach out to the bar associations there, uh, collaborate with uh, the leadership of the CIR, uh, either the Asia Pacific, the Middle East, the, you know, the, the, the you know, or the central leadership, reach out to that country's bar, have a joint training, become a trainer, you know, and there's a lot of need. And there are a lot of governments who are, you know, they need help. They, they are setting up an arbitration infrastructure and they need help. Be the leader who reaches out to them and say, look, we are from the CIR. Uh, we are willing to help, you know, get in touch with the center or, or the other leadership. And you can be a catalyst of real change and that will change the world. The word leadership, not surprisingly, comes up very regularly in what you've just said then. Um, how? How do you become a leader? Right. You, you know, I think, Marion, a leader doesn't have to have a title. Nobody needs, you don't need to be a branch chair. You don't need to be the president of the CIR. You don't need to be like Jonathan, the chair of the BOT, to be a leader. You be a leader by thinking, acting, behaving like a leader. You could be just a normal member, say, in the Singapore branch, and you could, you know, you could say you were traveling in Laos and you suddenly realize uh, we've, we've had perhaps no arbitration or not enough, not sufficient training in Laos. So you could get in touch with the, you know, the Lao president of the Lao Bar, introduce yourself as uh, being a member of the CIR, uh, you know, and, and, and have a dialogue on what needs to be done in Laos and then be the catalyst for change. You know, then talk to central leadership, be part of a team that puts up a training team that goes down uh, and then runs trainings and then, you know, then, you know, the, the, you, you could then say, I want to then meet ministers in the prime minister's office to talk about your arbitration infrastructure. Look, it all starts with you and it ends with you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a perfect note for which to bring everyone back in on the panel. Um, we are now going to move into the, into the third section, which is where we pick up the questions. They're still coming in. But um, it's probably best if um, Catherine, Jonathan, Francis, if you all unmute. My first topic is a day in the life of. You've got one sentence. Why did you decide to become involved with the CIR? Why? One sentence. Catherine, go first. Because you offered me a fantastic job, which I was <laughs> delighted to accept because it was so exciting and, uh, you know, so in line with, with, with my values and, 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 and just such a massive opportunity. Oh, thanks, Catherine. We're so pleased you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan, one sentence. Why did you decide to become involved with CIR? I thought I could make a change. Uh, arbitration uh, was regarded as a little bit stuffy in the uh, times gone by, and I thought it needed to have some fresh blood injected into it. And uh, that's one of the reasons where I stepped forward and volunteered my services to become a trustee. Okay, and I think Francis, you probably feel you've answered that, but the joy of hearing you again in one sentence, I'm not gonna deprive my audience of that. Wow. I needed training and arbitration in arbitration and uh, CIR gave that to me. Thank you. Now, look, the big topic, the next one we have to we have to touch on is diversity. Um, there's a question come up in the Q&A box about whether we will be introducing positive discrimination to achieve. 
the objectives of diversity and equality. Now, while Catherine's having a think about that, because she spoke at length about diversity, Jonathan, Francis, I'd like to talk to you about what are we doing about diversity at leadership level? It's not just about the panels of tribunals. It's not just about um, council. It's about leadership within the CIR. Jonathan, any, any views on that? Well, I'd like to think that we have a pretty diverse uh, board of trustees. We have representatives from all sorts of uh, backgrounds, gender and ethnicity on the board from around the world. So it is a pretty diverse uh, board uh, and it can always improve. In fact, we are undergoing a governance review at the moment uh, and that will uh, in part deal with increasing the diversity opportunities. I think the other aspect to diversity is uh, in skills. I mean, uh, certainly at board level, uh, we have a board which is mainly made up of lawyers and I don't think that's necessarily a great thing. We would really like to encourage those with skills beyond being lawyers uh, and upskill, if you like, uh, the board of trustees, those who are more familiar uh, with accounts, uh, perhaps with the businesses that they represent. I think that's the sort of diversity, which is very important. I think it can be too uh, narrow a view if you look at diversity just in relation to sort of, um, you know, sort of gender, ethnicity and the like. I think that skills and accessibility for the socio from the socioeconomic side of things. So, yes, I think that uh, there's a lot going on in that regard uh, and a lot to achieve, but we hope we're getting there. And Francis, do you have any reflections uh, to share with us on diversity and inclusion in the role of president? I mean, you know, we, we, we stand for diversity. Look at our membership, look at the, the, the panel. I mean, look at the audience. And, you know, in, in terms of precedents, yes, we've had precedents from all across the globe. And I think, um, you know, CIR to me is synonymous with di diversity at every, you know, nationality, gender, age. Um, it runs through our DNA. Yeah. And Catherine, the question was thrown up. Are there any plans to, to look at uh, positive discrimination as part of the EDI initiative? Well, I'm a great believer in, in, in positive action where, where you need to take positive action to ensure that you are you do have a diverse representation in, in any particular, you know, with any particular issue. And I, and I think that, you know, where that is appropriate, we will certainly look at that. I mean, I think, you know, I think we have got a very, as, as Francis and Jonathan were saying, we have got a really sort of diverse um, organisation, you know, but there are some pockets where we can look at encouraging um, you know everyone from you know certain backgrounds to, to, to maybe get involved and, and step up you know so so in in, partic in particular areas that there may be a gender issue you know where we'd like to see sort of what more women stepping up or, or there could be you know there could be um, the opportunities for people of color but I think you know that that sort of socioeconomic background enabling people perhaps from um, you know less wealthy backgrounds to to also get involved in the profession is, is key and and so you know we will look at that on a on a sort of a case-by-case basis and make sure that we've got diversity across everything we do. And perhaps you know, picking up on that, a question has come in for you specifically, Catherine, as to whether it's you, your view, shared by some of the delegates attending, that one of the most valuable things about the Institute is the friendship it helps us to create across the world. Uh, absolutely, and I think that that creating that diverse community of, of dispute resolvers, you know, that, that is that is the sort of perfect vision. And that's obviously reflected in, in where we're getting to with it, with the new strategy. And, you know, I think one of the things that, if anything's come out of the, the, the pandemic, that ability to get online and to talk to people and and you know and have these sort of events is has been so important i've managed to meet every branch chair and you know speak to to every branch around the world if i'd have been jumping on and off a plane i i wouldn't have been able to do that so having those regular conversations and that dialogue and and understanding what's happening across the the, the, the world is 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 so important and it is that friendship and it's that camaraderie you know that that enables us to 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 come together as friends in these sorts of events francis friendship is simple isn't it yes yes i mean i i think it's a community 
and um, you know, CIAB allows you entry into that community. You know, you become part of, of this global community. You meet the uh, the luminaries. You meet uh, members. You 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 get to meet leaders at every level. You know, and 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 you know, CIAB is spread over more than 130 countries. I've lost count. Is it 18,000 members? You know, yeah. yeah, become part of the family. Yeah. And taking up, building on that, that family and that friendship, can we talk about our USP, our unique selling point? How will CIR, do you think, use its training experience and membership to distinguish itself now in the global economy, a global economy that I think is beginning to engage with ADR? Well, Marion, I think it starts by everyone on this you know, webinar realizing that they are a key part of this equation. CIR today is the uh, global, uh, not only the oldest, but the global, preeminent global training and accreditation or uh, arbitral uh, organization, uh, ADR, mediation and adjud adjudication as well. Now, you know, we need, to, we need to stamp our presence in the globe as the, you know, in all aspects of ADR, in particular in global uh, thought leadership, which I think the leadership is focusing on very heavily now. But I think beyond that, every member needs to realize that CIAP needs all of its members all across the face of the world to play a leadership role. You need to, as a member in your country, in your jurisdiction, ask yourself, what does your country need in terms of ADR? Does it need help in its infrastructure? Does it need more training? Does the other parts of, the, of your country or your region which needs more training? Are there neighboring countries which need a chapter, which need training, which need assistance? And you can be the catalyst for, and you you need to be the leader to to spread the light of CIR across the globe and strengthen, you know, its presence where it is already entrenched. Because you know, you know, um, we are just a, a a vast organization, you know, of of many many members, and we lead through our members. Thank you, Francis. Do any, any of the other panelists want to, to add on to that, or should we move on to? Uh, I just I wanted to. to May I just me mention, I think the other point that always needs to be made about the CIR is that we are the global uh, professional disciplinary body. Uh, ethics in ADR has uh, come to the forefront of many uh, of the conferences we attend, and it is a, a constant issue. Uh, and, and people sometimes forget that we do have the disciplinary powers over our members. Uh, to ensure that we that the community attains the highest professional standards and i think that's a point that's always worth m remembering about what the institution stands for well, and I think the final USP is, is really those purse nominals that, 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 that are recognised around the world, you know, and I think we're the only organisation, the, the only ADR organisation that does that training, that has those professional standards that Jonathan mentioned, that has those purse nominals that are recognised are recognised globally. And that is a, you know, a fantastic USP to have. Yeah. Now, we can't spend this entire session patting ourselves on the back. So <laughs> getting this job, we're doing it good. I personally, like all of you, believe we do get a lot right. But let's look at some of the things that were coming out that perhaps it's feeling amongst the membership we don't get right. Let's look at the other forms of dispute ADR, because it's not all about arbitration. One of the themes that came up was mediation. What are we doing? How can the CIR promote mediation as the powerhouse I think Marion was going to ask about mediation, so maybe I can uh, I can maybe sort of pick pick that up. I think that's where that question was going, and I and I mean I think we need to do do more on mediation. And um, you know I am a mediator, so I think I, th there's a real sort of commitment certainly um, to to do more. We've we've just launched our our virtual mediation training. Uh, this week, um, which has massive take up. So there's a real, there's a real appetite for mediation training. We're looking at putting together a, a, a sort of a much more strategic approach to, to mediation as well. So we're looking at our strategy on mediation so that we can really get that, that global reach and start promoting it in a way that, you know, is, is, is probably, um, I think, 
you know, we've certainly seen with our with with international arbitration. So I think there's more that we can do there. And we're also working collaboratively with other organisations on on mediation. So we have done some work with CEDA, and we will work with other organisations across the globe to to help promote mediation and, and really put mediation on the map. Um, I think you know one of the one of the the issues is is our name, and I think thinking about our name is something that I do, I do think we need to to. To, to do and, and discuss with with the with the trustees, but we are an inclusive ADR body, and we'll certainly be looking at mediation and adjudication as well. Um, so it's it's not just going to be about international arbitration, if that indeed is the perception out there, because it's you know it it isn't it isn't where you know that isn't the direction of travel at all. It's it's all about ADR. And I'm glad you picked up adjudication there as well, because that is also a topic that's being raised in the questions. Francis, Jonathan, anything you'd like to add on that? None. I think it's been adequately answered by Catherine. <laughs> Only adequately? <laughs> Very adequately. You are a... He's a hard taskmaster. The way I see it, the dispute resolution starts in the playground and can end up as a, a, a dispute between two countries. And it's tracking that range of disputes and putting our imprint on disputes of all characters, which I think that we can do and make a real difference to the way society engages. So, you know, uh, I mean, the Irish branch, for example, taught teachers how to mediate. I think that's a fabulous thing to do. So we're, I think, you know, th there's a lot of interest in all aspects of prevention of disputes, collaboration, avoidance, then mediation, and if necessary, arbitration. Well, don't go because I want to put something, I want to challenge you with something else, something that I call English centricity. One of the other themes that came through the pre-submitted questions, uh, will the Institute, when will it allow the use of training and the use of um, education in a language other than English? Why does the Institute always seem to concentrate on English events, English law? Over to you. Uh, is it, well, if that's addressed to me, well... The answer is that uh, we have already started doing uh, some of our courses in Spanish, but actually doing a wholesale um, uh, overhaul of the courses into different uh, languages is quite complex because it does raise some ethical issues uh, and uh, it, it does uh, require, it, it's quite complex, but I think it's part of our global strategy I'm sure Catherine will come in on this. Uh, so we are keen to de-anglicise, if you like, as far as we're able, and here we are, you know, this is what we're doing now. Uh, it's not the easiest process, but it's something that we've got on our agenda. Is that right, Catherine? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, we, we've, we've translated some of our courses into different languages. So, as you mentioned, Spanish, but also Arabic. I think it's, it's, it's a bigger issue in terms of how we move away from the sort of English centric, because we do have our professional standards and ethics, and we need to make sure that if we are going out into, into, into countries which are non-English speaking, and, you know, that, that we have that right as well. And we also need to think about all of our materials are currently in, in English. So if we're going to engage practitioners around the world in different different countries, what do we have to do around translating uh, some of that material as well? So it's actually, it's a bigger issue than just maybe merely translating our, our courses into different languages. It is about our professional standards, it is about our ethics, it's about our, our guidelines, and it's also about all our materials. But we're certainly, we're certainly looking at what we can do, and we will be looking to, to, to go out um, over the course of the next few years into into some different languages. I think the other issue is picking up on, on civil jurisdictions and, and thinking about our course materials in light of, you know, because we have been quite common law focused. So, um, so I think there's, there's opportunities as well to sort of look at our materials from a civil law perspective and make sure that they, they are relevant in all the jurisdictions that, that we're operating in. No, that's great. Now look, next, the next topic is one for Francis because I know he's been doing a lot of work um, building the branch network. 
The question is, will the Institute continue to provide online training even after the pandemic so as to provide the widest possible access, such as to members or potential members? And one of the things we haven't flagged up is that there are a significant number of non-members who signed up to uh, join this, this webinar. Um, we, will, will we be training in those areas, where, in countries where there are no branches? Is that the plan? Yes. I mean, obviously, our game is to fill the need all across the globe. And um, you're quite right, Marion. I think one thing that we've learned, you know, as uh, Jonathan has, and uh, Catherine have put a keen finger on the pulse of, you know, we've learned that this uh, virtual tool uh, is a powerful, um, you know, in, in the arsenal of things that you have in order to spread uh, education and training across the world. And previously, I think the default thinking was that, you know, you needed a physical room and you needed trainers to be physically in front of you. But in many of the you know, developing countries uh, where you know, we, they will have access uh, to, 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 to computer screens, we can now uh, penetrate a lot more rapidly and uh, to, to a greater extent than ever before uh, by virtue of the virtual uh, training platforms that we are, you know, we perfected and we are continuing to perfect. You know? And then what we need is to spread out into the civil law side a little bit more as uh, and the language aspects as uh, uh, Catherine and, and, and Jonathan have been speaking about. It, entirely right. Can I now, well, and while I've got you, Francis, I've got to ask senior counsel this. Things I wish I'd known. Huge number of questions have come in from people who are not lawyers, um, coming from a wide range of um, training and professional backgrounds in pharmaceuticals, as engineers. What's the outlook like? for careers in ADR for non-lawyers? Now, what I would say is there is a lot of scope uh, because there are, you know, there are a lot of disputes which are very, very technical. And in many, many cases, we rely on experts um, and, you know, to, to brief the panel. And it would be of great assistance to a panel uh, to have experts in the subject matter. But I think, look, and a lot of people might disagree with me, but the one thing that I would recommend and you know, this question comes up to me, you know, as a president and I'm, there are many disputes coming up where, you know, as president, I'm supposed to nominate uh, or appoint adjudicators, uh, arbitrators, e even in a technical dispute, what happens is I will have a QS on the one hand, a very experienced QS. And then I'll, on, the, on the other hand, I'll have a QS who uh, doesn't necessarily have a law degree, but he has legal training, right? He has done some diploma in, in law and so when it comes to the chase, um, you know, because appointing someone as an arbitrator, he would have to deal with um, issues of procedure, of practice, of evidence, right? So obviously the QS with some training in law will have an edge. So I would say that there is a lot of scope for, for non-lawyers, certainly, it, it, you know, but I think uh, some training in the other aspects, the non technical, but the, the legal aspects of evidence and procedure will take you a long way. You don't need to necessarily do a law degree. No, no. Anything anyone wants to add on that before I ask the next things I wish I'd known? I'm going to ask. We offer that as part of the, the training. Obviously, we're doing, you know, as part of the, the, the pathway training we, we, we offer, then the, there is that that grounding in law, which which I think is important. But you don't you, know, you don't need to be a qualified lawyer to, to undertake that training. Right. Uh, Jonathan, um, is uh, how will newly qualified arbitrators, newly qualified ADR practitioners, let's let's broaden that out. Mm. How will newly qualified ADR practitioners be able to adequately network in the new COVID world? We don't well, offer we training. In it. We, we don't offer networking training. No. Well, I think that um, again joining into events like this we've got a networking session after this uh, linkedin is a good way of getting oneself about uh, there are if you go on linkedin there are uh, and other uh, websites you will find that there are many events now being held where you can get in contact with people but i think it's um, i used to say that uh, pre-virtual days, it was a question of shoe leather. You had to go and see people and <laughs> expend the shoe leather. 
now you have to get on your computer and you have to dial up and keep in touch with people and that's something which you have to do whether you're new to the role or whether you are already in the role you have to keep in touch as best you can and we have a great opportunity to do it uh, there's nothing like keeping in touch with existing colleagues and new colleagues so that's what you have to do and if you look in the chat box you can see that people have been reaching out and, ex and exchanging views Catherine mm. Santos, do you want to add anything on networking no, I mean, I think networking, I mean, online networking is 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 obviously, I think, here, here to stay. And uh, I think it can work. Well. I've seen it work really well and hoping hope people will stay around for the for the session after this. I think when we get back to a little bit more of of, uh, of of normality I think there's still opportunities for for face to face. And I know that the branches will be will be holding events sort of locally so please do you know get involved with your with your local branch get involved with some of the events that will be offering centrally and and getting and keep involved virtually so you know i think there will be opportunities um there and they will continue well before i move to the quick fire round which i'm going to try and bring our audience in on can i just ask you this i'm asked this if i had to identify one question that pursues me around the cir when i go to meetings how do I get in to see a live mediation, a live arbitration? How do I get involved in turning the live adjudication? Now, I know we've touched on it, but perhaps you could just develop a little bit what we're doing on that front and the ways to get close to that live experience. We have a mentoring uh, system, uh, which I hate to say is not very well subscribed by the senior members of the profession. And I would like to encourage those who uh, are involved at a senior level to become mentors. Um, I also think that getting involved with things like the Viz Moot, there are many competitions around the world, whether they're mediation competitions. I, I mean, one of our uh, uh, trustees, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, did a fantastic mediation uh, competition uh, in India. Um, with the local bar and local students and I mean it's this sort of thing that really helps people to get a feel. You will find that uh, there are some arbitrators and mediators who are very well disposed to helping those who want to get a leg up in having them sit in on conferences with the consent of all others. I do that and uh, I think that it's more difficult with hearings because of the privacy and the confidentiality. But um, I think there are those parties and those councils who are willing to assist in letting people have that experience. But it's the mentoring generally, which I encourage people to offer and take up. And Francis, Catherine, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I think, you know, I think as Jonathan says, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it is tricky because it does require consent of the, of, of all the parties to, to get involved. But I think, you know, if people can keep in mind those opportunities for, for younger members and people coming through, then that's fantastic. We're also going to do some, some work workshops on how to go about getting your first, your first appointment and, and looking at how we can support uh, members through their career as they, as they work towards that first appointment and getting themselves uh, uh, established. So I, you know, I think there's more that we can do, but it, you know, but it, it is also a, a sort of a call out to our more experienced um, practitioner members to, to try and help us with, with, with that. And people are coming into the chat room and they're, and they are indicating things that are being done um, to help. So in the time honored fashion, we have reached almost the end of our session. I'm going to do a very quick now, quick fire. It's how every panel show ends, doesn't it? On poor channel television, or perhaps even also on good channel television. So let's do it, because I'd like also to act as a bridge now to start to bring in the participants. All of you, please find the chat box. I'm going to put three propositions. They're capable of being answered yes or no. I'm going to ask the panel whether their answer is yes or no. And then I'm gonna ask you, our, our, our watchers, our members, the heart of the Institute to indicate your answer. So the first question, and these have come in from outside, Inter international commercial courts are real alternative to arbitration. Yes or no? No. No. 
Yes. <laughs> you right. come from Singapore. <laughs> right. Okay. Over to you. Everyone, let's see what the let's see what the answers are. And it's flashing through. It is fascinating to see where you're all coming from. Let's let's have a look. What have we got so far? I would say that no. No is distinctly proving to be the answer. The odd yes, no, we're, we're finally turning to yeses. Keep them coming. I'm going to close this one out in 10 seconds. And there are more of you out there who can participate. It's a bit of a resounding no, I think. Right. Do you predict, and I'm going to go to the members first, do you predict a shift from litigation to arbitration following the pandemic? Yes or no? Let's see what, 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 what's coming in. Members first on this one. It shift to arbitration following lockdown. Still mixed. Still mixed. What's your, what's your feeling, panel, that it's coming out as mainly yes? I think I think I think yes. I think because of some of the challenges faced by by the court, some of the backlog and things, that there is a real opportunity. Not not just for arbitration, but actually for for all forms of um, of ADR. Now that's a typical lawyer. You're going to change the question. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Francis, what's it was? Yes, yes, or, yes or no to a real shift? To Depends on country in Singapore. No. No, I, I, I don't see a significant shift as a result of the pandemic. OK, right. Now, this is my last question, and you can all answer this, panel and members, simultaneously. The future of ADR is looking good. Yes or no? The future. Yes, of course. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, let us see what our members are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ah, resounding. Yes. Yes. Well, that I think. Can I go? Can I thank the three of you, Francis, Catherine, Jonathan, for exchanging your views so clearly uh, and not holding back, making making your positions absolutely clear. Can I also, on your behalf, thank those that can't be seen but who have been involved in setting this up? Primrose Ante Bennett, the event manager. Mercy McBrow, the Research and Academic Affairs Manager, and Camilla Godman, the Director of Membership. There will be others I know at CIR who participated as well. Thank all of you on behalf of the membership. I will applaud you. This is the one moment where I feel we lack that sense of theatre, but thank you very, very much. Thank you. And please wait now because you will be put, uh, ushered virtually, I think was the phrase I used, into your meeting rooms. All of the panel are staying on to do that and they're being joined by all of the directors and many other representatives of CIR. Looking forward to talking to you there. Good. What did they used to say? Good night and good luck? Or just good job, Marion. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Marion. Cheers. <laughs>